I've been thinking about how to make a fresh homepage video and I want it to be about orthographic mapping and set for variability and phonemic proficiency and all these things I've been reading about. Um, and I was doing a Murray Kondo, as you do in the holidays, and came upon these retired pillows. I thought, well, they'll make quite a good brain, won't they, if we roll them up? And we'll join them together in the middle here with this nice corpus callosum made out of safety pins. And we'll put the speech, I'll put sounds over on this side. In the left hemisphere you have your sounds. Up the front here is the frontal lobes with your executive functions and those kind of things. And the back is your visual system. And there's a little area uh, in your left um, side of your brain that is called the visual word form area. And that's where you feed your letters in and link them up into your speech system. And that's how you learn to read. And so I wanted the, this video to explain why it's a really bad idea to give children repetitive, predictable texts that encourage context, guessing from context um, and memorising. And also it's a bad idea to give children who are just starting out lists of high frequency words to memorise. Um, that can really confuse them. So I thought I'll use this uh, video to explain those things as well as some of those other complex concepts. Uh, this is a beginner or a struggling reader uh, whose brain is about to meet some high frequency words. So I'll put a bunch of high frequency words that I've got here. These are the sort of typical ones that um, kids are learning when they first start school. And essentially they're presented these as though they are a single thing that they have to learn. So what children tend to do who are good at phonemic awareness is, phonemic awareness, awareness that words are made up of sounds, is that they notice that on the back we have these nice hooks here. So this word, it, is made up of i and t. And the child with good phonemic awareness can take that apart and they can Attach it to their speech system. I goes with that one there. The letter I goes with it. I and goes here. And they can map it on because when we're listening to words, they go in as a stream of sounds, sequence of sounds. And so when we're reading, we put the letters in as a sequence. Initially, when we're sounding out, as a sequence of letters. We go along from here and we go at and when we're beginners. And so you start mapping them sequentially onto the sounds. And there's hooks on these that um, you can attach these to. The child who has got poor phonemic awareness doesn't know what the sounds are, isn't pulling words apart into sounds and is just treating words as whole words, is trying to remember it in the right hemisphere more as though it's a picture. And so what they're doing is taking this and putting it here and it falls off. <laughs> and it keeps falling off. And I have seen children who are in grade four or grade five who have been learning the hundred most common words four, <laughs> five, six years sometimes and you put them in and they just fall off because there's no hooks here. The hooks for remembering words are over here. Now what happens when you're giving children a whole lot of words that have got for example digraphs like th, so when they're learning the alphabet they're learning that's t and that's h and that's a and that's t but if they're learning this as a whole word and they don't know that that's not t, that's th, um, so they don't know to break it here, then that's a bit of a problem because these are these are five-year-olds, you know. Do they, how are they going to know that that's one new, that's a different thing from that kind of t? Um, that's a t and that one's a th. th. Um, and so a lot of these high-frequency words create real problems for them. Ooh, okay, that's good. Oh, okay. So... They are going woo ass. If they're sounding it out, they're going woo ass. Woo ass? Oh, I don't know what that is. The same thing for the other high frequency word that's frequently in this little set that beginners are given. I, s, is. Hmm. Now, children who have good, it's called set for variability, children who can kind of fudge it and figure out that, that even though you say woo ass, woo ass, they can figure out, oh, that's was and, and still map it correctly onto the 
map this letter A onto an O, oh, a no, like you know, when you have W and A together, was, want, wallet, wand, it's an O oh sound. So they can actually do that thing and get the hooks to work. Uh, this one is, you know, we've got his and has and does and was. It's a zzz when it's at the end of words very often. So they can get that little hook there and make it attach to the zzz rather than having to attach it to the s. Uh, so children with strong language skills have better set for variability. Set for variability is basically how good are you at figuring out a word from a um, less than perfect production. It's what we use when we're listening to Kath and Kim and they say, I want to be effluent. We can correct that to affluent and get the joke um, but if you're not very good at um, fudging words and figuring out you know understanding people with very strong accents or you know if it's a lot of noise in the background then uh, that then your set for variability goes down and you're less able to figure out from the distorted or, or not correct signal exactly what the word is and some kids are better at that than others so Here's my latest effort to help people with teaching children to sound out words rather than memorise and guess. So this is a free workbook. You can download it from my website and go into the freebie section. And uh, it starts off with app, st, and you trace the letters saying app, ah, 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 and then you fill the gaps in the words, sat and sat, listening to the beginning sound. Then the end sound is the next one, is the next hardest. The middle sound is the hardest to hear. And then write the word yourself and then read this, trace it and um, illustrate. And then we add another sound ear. And then mix and match and build more words and the same sort of drill and gradually learn the basic uh, sound letter relationships. And it goes with... Um, a couple of sets of decodable books. I'll just let those get in focus. <laughs> Hello. Oh, there they go. Uh, those, the pocket rockets. The pocket rockets also come in miniature size in sort of teacher boxes. So you can have a set of, I think it's 10 in a box. So you buy three boxes of those and you've got your beginning readers for the, all the preps, all the, all the five-year-olds. And uh, these ones are also very affordable letters and sounds ones. Then... Uh, you can also get other decodable books which follow a different teaching sequence but not that different. The Little Learners Love Literacy, they're very nice. There's an Aussie, there's the um, Initial Lit Readers are also very nice. Uh, there's the Decodable Readers Australia or the other Australian one that I know of. There are also um, British ones, the Flyleaf Publishing. And uh, there are some from Dandelion. There's thousands of these Dandelion ones. The um, Sounds Right books are nice as well. And then if you've got older kids who are learning how, about sounding out, I, um, I love the... Um, Phonic Books ones, here's a new set, that dog that goes, it's the same as the Magic Belt set, same level. Um, here's the Moon Dogs, and there's thousands of those in all different levels, um, really worth looking at. There's a brochure that I'm sure they'll send you if you ask them any, any of the suppliers. And uh, these ones are Sound Out Chapter Books I've used a lot. Um, they're American ones from High Noon Books. Judy Keane in Tasmania writes the... Um, Rip Rap books, these ones are for a slightly older upper primary or um, high school student and these are her new set of camping club ones for the slightly younger child and um, they're highly decodable and simple spelling patterns and then gradually you build up and learn more patterns. I've also got a set of embedded picture mnemonics you can download from my website. They are $10 plus GST. The person who drew them is an artist called Kat McInnes in Melbourne. And the idea is that research has shown that if a letter shape has a word, like p for penguin, embedded in it, that children that helps children to remember the letter better. So b for bug, and you would, of course, be practising writing the letter shape correctly to help with that memory of um, how that works. T for tiger, so this is the embedded embedded picture mnemonics that she's done. I'll have the good for girl, mm, for monster, and it's got up for undies and sh shells and zh for Asia. That's uh, sh and zh are a pair of sounds. Uh, voiced and voiceless. We'll talk about that in a minute. For house and so on. And I've, I've got a, a mnemonic, not just for the single letter, um, the ones that are typically represented with single letters, but also with two letters. So the E sound, we typically write with double E, but there's a lot of other ways to write it. I as in tie, O as in boats. I think she's done a lovely job of illustrating them. U as in food. 
and U as in Newt, it's a little bit hard to think of something to do for U, Oi as in Coin and so on and I'll just show you how I've displayed them on the wall. Being a speech pathologist I've organised them according to the sounds, not in alphabetical order. So you can see these sounds here, you stop the air and let it go when you're making these sounds P and B. So they're a voiced and voiceless pair, P with no voice, B with your voice, T, D, K, G. And these are the other spellings for K. This one is actually two sounds. But um, so stop sounds, stop the air and let them go, going from the front of your mouth to the middle to the back. And then you have the same thing with the nasal sounds. This, the air goes up through your nose for these three sounds. Mm, mm, mm. And then these ones are the friction sounds. So, those ones actually have a stop sound in them. T is how you get ch. And d is how you get j. The combination sounds. And some children will hear that and say, very well heard, but it doesn't really help us with spelling. Um, and doesn't have a pair anymore, apparently it did in Old English. And then you have oo and ye, which are very vowel-like sounds, and er and all, also often um, confused with vowels. And you, you notice that these are often these letters are often used in vowel spellings. Um, and for example, if you have the word play, it has an a sound, but when you make it into play ying, you do hear a y. So it's quite clever. Or slow, and you make it into slow were, then you do have a w sound. So um, it's quite clever the way that we use our consonant letters in vowel spellings. These consonant letters. This one is is also used in a lot of vowel spellings, especially Australian English, because we don't say er at the end of syllables. Um, so uh, yeah, so r and er and or. And this one in walk and uh, salmon and um, calm. There's a lot of letter L um, is used in the spellings of vowels. So then the, the vowels are a, a, e, or a, u, are the ones that must have a consonant after them. You can't say a, a word that ends in i in English. It's not allowed. You must have a consonant. So they're called the checked vowels by linguists and the short vowels in education. A, e, i, o, u, u. <laughs> so those ones are the long vowels, supposedly. Um, they're really just different vowels. They're not really elongated versions of these. And you can see that um, these ones and these ones often share a spelling. So a uh and a uh as in up and u as in uh, u as in human or um, this one u uh, as in look and u as in food. I've included those there just to make that clear to little kids that you know the letters are not always the same thing as the sounds. These ones are uh, uh, or er uh, ear are, are controlled vowels in some books and these ones are ow and oi are, are diphthongs. A lot of these sounds are actually two sounds moving from one location to another. Ow, oi, and kids will again hear that and say, very well done, yeah, but we treat this as one thing, ow. And we treat this as one thing, i, even though it's really two things. Having the sounds that are produced in a similar way kept together can really help you when it comes to things like explaining to children why of with a v sound is written like this. Here's if with f as you'd expect and here's of but these are a pair and so sometimes we use this spelling, um, this one's spelling for this one. Same thing for here. Um, let's see, we've got, you know, sit and bus, all very logical, sorry about my bad writing, but then we've got is, has, was, it's a z sound written with an S, um, plurals like dogs, and we can put them there, dogs, cats, cats has got a soft sound before the S, t is soft, so this is soft s, but this one is a voiced sound, g, so this is voiced dogs. When we're talking about past tense, uh, we sometimes say, for example, jumped, like this, jumped. That's a t sound because that is soft. Or we could have, it's a hot day outside, I'm going to put this one, fan. That's a voiced sound, so this one is also voiced d. So we hear d in this word and we hear t in this word. And it's because of the preceding sound. Sounds smooshed together in connected speech. 
uh, and affect each other's production. But these are a pair and uh, so they're very close together in production and that helps to explain this. Once children know one spelling for each sound, you can start to teach variations. And um, often children have got variations in their own names anyway, and so they'll be aware of them. So um, we can have see and meet. Oh, but there's also meet. And what else? See, swim in the sea. And there's also B, this is an open syllable, so the vowel is at the end, so it can't be E, eh, because it's not allowed at the end. Me, and he, and she, and then you could have these, so this is E something E, these, um, theme, what theme are we studying, concrete, athlete, all those kind of words. And then there are many, many more ways to spell E. And so you can gradually introduce them. So if you've got someone in your class called Phoebe, poor Phoebe, she's got two hard spellings in her name, F with a PH, which you'd also put on the F thing, E with OE, that's tricky, and B like that, that B is like that, that E is the same as this E. But it's also got an OE one, or Phoenix, the same thing, poor Phoenix, who's always in trouble. And then um, there's, you know, E like in grief or chief, Chief, can't spell, excuse me. Um, grief or grieve, often these are uh, uh, grieve and grief or chief and thief and thieve or belief and believe. I.e. often goes with a f or a v and they're in a pair. Um, so you can start to really draw lines and links, make links, because that helps with memory, between the sounds and the letters and the spelling patterns that are all related to each other in a sensible way if you have a good understanding of what the sounds are. Now, developing awareness of sounds in words and then mapping letters onto them and understanding how each sound is spelt and gradually working your way through sounding out words is what beginners and strugglers must do to get their engines going, their reading engines. But it's not what skilled readers do because skilled readers, after a while of doing that sounding out thing, get extremely proficient at pulling words apart into sounds and they can whip a sound out of the middle of a word. You can say play, take up the all and they'll immediately say pay. They do not have to think about it because words just fall apart into their component sounds in their heads um, and they are then able to really easily map the, sound, the spellings onto them and uh, after a while they start to unitize words in memory so that they can just look at a word and without having to work left to right through the whole thing they can just look at a word and look at all the letters at once bang because you have you know 14 characters that you can look at at once in one transition of your eyes across the page uh, and you can immediately recognize words so fast that you don't have to put any cognitive effort into reading and getting the words off the page, you can concentrate all your cognitive resources on thinking about what you're reading. So for a long time, phonics was a bit on the nose and people were just saying, no, children will just memorize words and they'll learn to read the same way they learn to speak by exposure. Well, we know that's rubbish. Children really do have to learn how to sound out words. They have to hijack the little bit of their brain. Um, and they all have to do it the same way. There are not many ways that children learn to read. There's one way, some kids are really good at it and do it easily, and a lot of kids, the kids I work with, it's a hard slog. Um, if you want to read about the theory of all of this and the research, the huge amount of research that's behind it, I would recommend this book by a bloke from America called David Kilpatrick, who is coming to Australia in August this year. Please don't email me asking me when, because it's going to be on the Learning Difficulties Australia website pretty soon and he also has a useful teacher manual and this is how useful it is the cover of mine has gone missing and I have no idea where it is but anyway it's called equipped for reading success and it has a lot of phonemic awareness activities in it that develop not just the sort of basic phonemic awareness of blending and segmenting but also this business of how to pull sounds out of words and put them back together and get really fantastic at thinking about sounds in words and that is the key you know there's kids who are just 
sounding out forever and they never seem to remember the words. They're the ones that have got to have that high-end phonemic awareness, that ability to pull out the all in play in lightning speed and you know add sounds in and take them out and really um, have facility with the sounds in words and that's when they will start to be able to map the words into memory as wholes and unitize them and then be able to start reading fluently. So I hope that's helpful and I uh, hope you find resources that will help you to teach in this way on my website and thank you for taking the time to watch this long homepage video.